Hi, everybody. Good morning. I just want to welcome you this morning to City First. We're so glad that you're here. Go ahead and stand up with us and let's worship. city first well hey you can feel free to be seated just sit down and and you know say hi to someone give them a smile it'd be so sad to come here this morning and not get a big big cheesy grin from somebody I was watching Top Gun top we had the second one last night so maybe give like your best Maverick and Goose impression just claps the forearm or not don't do that that might be weird 
Well, hey, it's great to be here with you guys this morning. Hey, if you are new or newish, we are so glad you're here. It can be so hard to come somewhere for the first time and walk through those doors. And we're just so glad that you're here with us today. And we would love to get to know you better. So if that's something you'd be interested in, there's a connect card in your seat front pocket and you can fill that out and we'll get back to you. Or if you're more techie and you have a phone, you can just, actually it's not up there, but if you have a bulletin, there's QR codes on the back. You can just scan that and it'll give you one digitally. So um, this is Eugene, save the trees, you know, whatever, whatever feels right for you. Well, hey, we get to do one of the most beautiful parts of our service now. We're going to receive our tithes and offering. This is a beautiful thing where at City First, we get to, we don't got to. It's not something you have to do, but something where if you just feel led by the Holy Spirit, like God has called you to be someone who faithfully gives, then we're so glad that you're part in helping with that. Would you guys pray over it with me? King Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity for us to be gathered here in your presence. This, this is a powerful moment, God. Your word says where there are two or three or a whole lot more gathered in your name that you are here. So God, when we know that when you are here, big things happen. So God, we just pray that as we, we give this morning, Lord, it wouldn't be about anything but honoring you in the exact way you've called us to do so. Lord, we just pray that you'd continue to bless our church and faith family. And Lord, that what you want to be done with these resources is exactly what would be done with them. Lord, we praise you for who you are. Amen. Well, like I said, I watched Top Gun. I think it's, it's, it's the second one called Top Maverick. Maybe not. I don't know the name, I just found it on Amazon Prime. And I gave it a watch, and so I'm gonna pretend that it's because I realized the 4th of July is this week and I was feeling patriotic. Really, I just think planes are cool. But hey, happy 4th of July, enjoy your week, enjoy celebrating with family with whatever you do. But right now in this moment, we're gonna celebrate a different kind of freedom. So would you guys stand up and worship Jesus with me? fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led through the fire and darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God So good With every breath that I 
times where we felt like we're in bondage and like Pastor Daniel said now we get to walk in the freedom of Christ Oh, my soul. 
This morning, Lord, I ask that as we lift our voices, God, that it was glory, honor, praise to you, Lord, that you would just fill our hearts and our minds, God, with the peace that surpasses all understanding, God, that we will feel your freedom and know your freedom and be able to feel acceptance and wholeness as a family in Christ. And Lord, this morning, I ask if there's anyone who needs healing, God, if there's anyone whose finances are just all out of sorts, or maybe their homes are out of sorts, um, relationships, God, that you would come and encounter them through the word that Patty is bringing today, God, that you would fill our hearts, fill our minds, knowing, God, that you have victory and that you have all control. We love you and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So good morning, church. Um, as we all know, Pastor Ryan and Pastor Kylie are on sabbatical, and uh, uh, Miss Patty Bus is going to be our uh, speaker for this morning. And I just want to share a little bit of uh, how amazing you can come up here, Patty, if you want. How amazing uh, this woman of God is. Uh, when I first started my recovery, I went to my very first. Uh, retreat in the Women's Life Change Program, and she was the speaker there. I still have a book of notes I took from her, and she has just been an incredible part of our of my journey. So I'm super excited to hear what she has to say to lead us this morning. So God bless you. I'm so Thank excited. You. You're welcome. Thank you, Kimber. That's so sweet. Praise the Lord. Is this okay right here? When am I in the right spot like this? Okay, good enough. Thank you. You know what? Let's do this. I really, I just felt from the Lord yesterday as I was praying, let's pray for Pastor Ryan and Kylie and the kids, shall we? I'm sure you have been, but here we are in this moment and we can agree together. Father, what a blessing that you would call our friends, my sister and brother, the shepherds of this particular flock into a sequestered space with you for refreshment, renewal, alignment. Lord, together in agreement today, we just say, speak to their hearts. Have the conversations that you want to have with them. You're the good shepherd who restores our souls and leads us in paths of righteousness, richly provides everything for our enjoyment and refreshing opens our eyes to see and our ears to hear you. So I pray that grace on them today, that this would be an incredibly fruitful sabbatical. And we bless the kids, that your name would protect them, cover them, and bless their time they'll have with grandparents, that you would mark the kids this summer. We just bless the entire Green family. Lord, do something in this summer that you long to do and their hearts are longing to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. So grateful to be with you all today. Uh, many of you are friends. You've been blessed. Steve and I in our journey. And it says Steve and Patty, and you got me. You got one member of the team today. My husband, Steve, had... Um, Another assignment um, came up after we had said yes to Kylie and Ryan about being here, and it's great, it's fine. You'll get to hear Steve next week, and I'll probably jump in here with him and sit in the front row and make faces and give him signals. But today, I don't have a sidekick to make faces and signals. So Daniel, Kimber, somebody, you know, give them to me like, Patty, no, or time's up, or that's off, that's off the path, or... <laughs> I don't know, you know, you got it. You have your sidekicks with you, and today I don't, but guess what? We have the Holy Spirit, and we're trusting him because he is really what we need. And uh, this morning, that is my absolute heart and posture. These are significant moments when the body comes together, and because he, this is where he uniquely dwells, 
in the two or more. And so, Lord, would you take what you've laid on my heart? It's your word. It's your voice. It's your truth. And you know exactly what each person needs to hear. And so take it and feed and strengthen and build up your body today. In Jesus' name. All right. Well, we're going to be in John 17 this morning. So if you want to open your Bibles, I don't have any slides. I'm sorry, but I'm just going old school on you. We're just going to have our word in front of us, and we'll get to the passage specifically in just a minute. I love actually this block of scripture between John 13 and John 17. I find myself there often. It's a unique space. I, I just feel like it's that. Here's what I like to think of it. It's a, it's a place where Jesus is having a conversation with friends. The crowds are not here. This John 13 to John 17 is the upper room discourse. It's, it's Jesus all before the night he would be betrayed. It's the time he's alone with the 12, then the 11. And he's having some final conversations. I love these five chapters. I'm not going to talk all about, but these are the places where the crowds are gone and the parables are over, and now he's talking plainly. And he's letting them know he's going away. He's letting them know the Holy Spirit is going to come, and it actually would be to their advantage that he would go so the Holy Spirit would come. He's washing their feet, and he's saying, this is what it looks like to be one of my followers in the world. You're going to be a servant. He's teaching us about that posture. He's letting them know that persecution's coming. He's letting them know that there will be grief and trouble in this world, but grief will turn to joy. He's letting them know they're not abandoned, even though he is going. He will never leave them alone. They know the way to where he's going. And he's giving them one new command. There's only one new command in the New Testament. And he says that, I am giving you a new command. You must love each other the way I'm loving you. He talks about vine life and living in deep, intimate connection with him. It's the, this life of intimacy and closeness that the Holy Spirit will enable them to have. He's talking to them about what it will be like because he's leaving. And so we, as disciples today, get to lean into a really intimate conversation in John 13 through John 17. Next time you're meditating and being in that space, think about that. That's the context of this passage that we're going to in 17. But then after he's done talking to them, he begins to pray. And this isn't Jesus away alone in the garden praying. This isn't Jesus away in the secret place. This is Jesus talking to the Father with the 11 now right there, hearing the prayer. And we get to lean in. And really, it's the longest prayer and the clearest, lengthiest prayer where we actually get to hear what Jesus is saying to the Father and we're going to pick it up. We're not going to read the whole prayer. It actually starts in John 20, well, John 17. And I'm going to focus in on John 20 through 26. Yes, John 17, verse 20 through 26. Jesus is praying for all the believers. So that's including us. The beginning of John 17, Jesus is praying and he begins talking to the Father and he's talking about, Father, let, let what I am about to do bring glory to you. He's praying for himself. Bring glory to, to, you, to your name as I complete the work of going to the cross. Then he begins to pray for the 11 and he's praying protection for them and that they would be one. And then he goes on to pray for all believers through all time and history and space and eras and countries and nations and languages. And this is how he's praying for us. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the 11 here. 
My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you've given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know you that, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love that you have for me would be in them and that I myself would dwell in them. Whether it's in movies, it's in history, or it's in our individual lives, experiences we've had, we know the last words of people before they leave the planet are weighty. It's what's most on their mind. It's what you want those left behind to remember, to not forget, to embrace. And these, these are the things that are on the forefront of Jesus' mind. He has these, bringing glory to the Father through his obedient step of sacrifice. And number two, that his followers would also bring glory to the Father by being one. Through their union with Jesus. I want to talk about, and I feel what was on the Lord's heart, is, is this oneness that he has prayed for, is praying for, and a prayer that will be answered. And I want to talk about unity for a minute first to talk about what it's not. <clears throat> this is not unity achieved by human activity or legislation or even agreeing to everything. It does not mean uniformity. It does not mean unity of structure, where everyone looks the same, thinks the same, has the same, has the same mode of doing things. Nor is this unity with each other some watered down compromise, lowest common denominator agreement. This is gritty, weighty unity. And it's otherworldly. It isn't by joining a party. <clears throat> it isn't by being in a specific club or a brotherhood. This, that you, this unity that Jesus is praying for among his people is found in the Holy Spirit. It is a unity based on our union with Christ, my union with him. For all of us who are born again, we receive a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. And we are born into a family. We are born into, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And it's, and it's because I am united to Christ, and you're united to Christ, and you are united to Christ, that we experience unity. It's unity found in our union with Jesus. And that is what Jesus is praying for. This is his work. It's living. It's organic. It's vibrant. I do not create unity. You do not create unity. We don't all sign on a covenant agreement. Jesus has created unity. And our role as his children, as his followers, as co-heirs is to lean into it, to yield to it, to give the Holy Spirit so much room in us that that unity just grows and grows and grows. Because what that spirit is doing in us is conforming us to the image of Jesus. Jesus is looking for one body on the earth, and that one body looks like him. 
And I don't get there by myself, by trying harder. I get there by yielding more to the Holy Spirit, giving him room in me. And so do you. This is the unity of the Trinity that we've been invited into. It's so beautiful. How many times he says this, Father, as you're in me and I'm in you, may they be in us. Jesus is wanting his bride, his church, his followers to actually experience the unity of the Trinity. It's glorious. It's a mystery. We don't have anything like it on the earth. And so it's hard for us to go, well, what is that unity? Really? It, it's from and in the Holy Spirit. You know, as he placed us in his family and he makes us members of one body, Ephesians 2 says this, we all have access to the Father by one spirit as members of God's household. And Christ Jesus is the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a temple for his dwelling. And we are united under this King Jesus, our common head. Now, this, con this unity is consequential. Let's go back to the passage. In verse 21, Jesus prays this. Father, I'm praying that they may all be one. As you are in me and I'm in you, may they be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. That's consequential. And Jesus emphasizes this by saying it I'm going to say, praying it again. Two verses later, verse 23. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Here's the phrase. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. The idea that the unity of God's people would display to the world that Jesus was truly sent from God and it was so important that Jesus emphasized it twice in this prayer. Listen, the unity of the believers, the followers of Jesus is a global evangelism strategy. Just think long and hard on that. The oneness of the body of Christ, the unity of believers across all ages, across continents and languages and races, is his, one of his evangelism strategies, and it's global. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't mean we don't speak the gospel, but what we should recognize is that our unity is speaking a gospel. And we have got to understand that because that's weighty and it will change how we look and think about other believers in our relationships with them, in this family, and in our city. It was in 1992 and Steve and I were taking a group of missionary students over to Russia. It was our second trip. 1991, the balls came down wide open for the gospel. It was like harvest time, harvest time, such a privilege to be going into those nations, Latvia, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia. For three years, Steve and I were training missionary teams and going in. It was like all hands on deck. The harvest is ripe. We have got to get the gospel out. And one, on one of those trips, we, took, we had a team of about 20 young adults. Some were American, some were Canadian. We had a couple Australians. And this particular trip, we were joining with a group of young Russian students as well. Young believers who had just come to Jesus. You know, for 70 years, communism had held the grip. There is no God. And you were persecuted if you tried to practice that. So the church was underground. The church was actually hidden. It was a little bit atrophied in some ways because they had been stifled. But they were alive. And we came and we worked with the church that had been underground. And there was a very dynamic, when I say dynamic, I don't mean charismatic. I just mean a very fervent young pastor that we connected with. And he had this vision, you know, while you're here, we're going to just rent this little amphitheater and we're all going to share the gospel together. And we're like, oh, that's right, let's do it. That's why we're here. But the wild thing that happened in this event was that it was like only two weeks before we were going to do it. And there were people that started getting added, added to this team. 
All of a sudden, there were two men from Ethiopia who had like a deliverance healing ministry, and they had come into the city we were with, connected with this pastor, and they were going to join into the crusade. Then there was um, a young worship team out of Latvia that the pastor knew of, and they were coming in. We were actually in the city of Sochi. They were coming into Sochi, and so he's like, well, let's, let's rope them in. Then there was this group of Armenian believers that was actually in the city at the same time. Now, get this picture. None of us, very few, our one common language was going to be through our Russian interpreter. Ethiopian, Armenian, American, Canadian, Latvian, Australian, declaring the kingdom of God together. And you know what? We didn't have a lot of time to sign off on all the theological dots and go, well, do you believe this? I mean, I'm going to tell you, there was people that were doing all kinds of, you know, very strong conservative space and very charismatic. But here's what we all knew. Jesus is the way of salvation. And he wanted to draw all men to himself. And you guys, there was such a unity of the spirit. No one was, no one had a banner. No one had a name. No big advertisements. No big, oh, we have the very best worship team. Or, you know, not like we do conferences sometimes in America, sorry to say. This was just a bunch of people going after Jesus and the gospel from lots of different backgrounds and nations. The unity of the church on display. It was one of the most beautiful experiences in my life. But it can be equally as beautiful in this space, in the city that we live in, too. Because when we see this, it speaks to the world. When we see a diverse people even through ages, it speaks to the world of another kingdom. It speaks to the world of another king. It speaks to the world of citizens who, who understand their citizenship is in heaven. It matters. So, with what's at stake, I think we could probably see and understand why there would be an attack on the unity of the church. Because it's very consequential. Unity is already created. There have been many attacks on our unity that, that, that put on display illegitimate disunity. And that hinders the gospel. At the beginning, I did not read out of John, at the very beginning of John 17, the, one of the first things Jesus prayed for his believers was he said, Father, protect them by the power of your name so that they may be one. Unity must be protected. Paul will pick this theme up in the New Testament. He'll take Jesus' words and he'll go on. There's so much talk about unity in the New Testament, but let me just give you a couple Writing to the church in Corinth and then in Ephesus, Paul writes this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, these are to the Corinthians, all the believers in the city of Corinth, this letter is coming. I appeal to you in the name of the Lord that you agree with one another in what you say and that there's no divisions among you, but that you be one perfectly united in mind and thought. There'd been quarreling that was happening. Then he goes on, 1 Corinthians 3.1. Brothers and sisters, I cannot address you as people who live by the Spirit, but only as people who are still worldly. You're mere infants. I give you milk, not solid food, because you're not ready for it yet. You know you are still worldly? Here's why. There is jealousy and quarreling among you. Are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? So Paul is talking about there's, this, there's, there's a growth process of coming into understanding and living in unity. And when there's quarreling and bickering over small things or who I'm following or what church is great, or, those, are, those are worldly conversations. Then he goes on in Ephesians 4, and he's saying to, the, to the, all the believers in Ephesus, as a prisoner of the Lord, he, which he was, he was in house arrest, I urge you, live, I'm urging you believers, hear these words, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Church of Eugene, live a life worthy of the calling we have received. Be completely humble and gentle 
Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body. There is one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all who is over all and through all and in all. Going on in chapter 4, Paul then talks about Listen, God gave gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, and those gifts are to equip and to help the body grow up into maturity. And this is what they're to do, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. But now listen, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, and we become mature, we're attaining to the full measure of the fullness of Christ, then we're no longer infants tossed back and forth by waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we grow up in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Jesus. And from Jesus, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does his work. See, here's here's the end game for your life and mine, that I would be conformed to the image of Jesus, and you would be too. That literally less of me, more of him. And day by day, I'm looking and looking more like him. And the more we all are looking more like him, we're growing into maturity. We're reflecting the head. Oh, it's so beautiful. And he's so big and he's so amazing that I can't contain him alone. Like, look around this room. You all reflect the glory of God, another beautiful facet of his character and his nature, his fingerprints, the breath of God in you. How beautiful is the body of Christ? How beautiful it is. Now, the reality is there is immaturity in us, right? And it's okay. He doesn't, make, he doesn't love us less. When my kids are not mature, I am not loving them less. I'm ta- I know they're growing up, and it's my job to help them grow. And that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's calling us to grow up into maturity, but his love is never changing, even when we're naughty. It's never changing. He's going to love us right into growth and maturity. And maturity looks like unity in this family and in our city, all the believers. Now, I'm not talking about, and I know Ryan and Kylie, this is their heartbeat. It was Pastor Les's heartbeat. This is not new news for y'all. But we are growing with ever-increasing glory. And there are deeper levels of unity. 2020 through 2022, did not, did, we didn't get a great report card from the body of Christ on unity. Thank you, Jesus. It's really important to get an assessment to see where the level of our discipleship is. I do not want to be deceived. Because he's looking for a people of depth and of substance. That love through hard things. That have conversations through hard things. That are peacemakers, not peacekeepers, but are peacemakers by walking in humility and having conversations that we need to have. And and agreeing to disagree on lesser things and believing the best of one another and praying for one another. This is the people God is raising up in this hour. And I want to say on the global scale and in the local scale, we could say this hasn't been like, um, this, hasn't, this, this, this hasn't looked very good the last few years. But there is another story and another narrative that I want to tell you, and I believe it's our best hour. Because when the world can look divided, and at odds and angst is the perfect time for the united body of Christ to walk in love and unity. You guys, this is our hour. And I also want to say this because I do believe that the enemy would also want us to think, whether it's through media or all the things that are the voices that are so loud and you must be discerning what we watch, what we listen to, right? Because if we tap in, I, I'm, I'm here as a mo- in a moment to, give, to be a herald 
of what is happening a little bit, and I have a small optic, but Steve and I get the opportunity to connect with other leaders in Canada, in England, in India, in, in Brazil, who, who, who like us are working in cities where the unity of the body is on the rise. And you guys, I wanna tell you something. There's never been a time in history where the church in cities has been more united than we are right now. That should alert us that the king is coming. And we're getting ready for him and he's coming for a unified people. So we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling and make every effort to walk in unity. So let's talk for just a minute. What does that mean for you and me? So that means for me that I'm keeping a short account in my relationships with brothers and sisters. I'm yield, I'm giving up, I'm laying down the right to be offended. I don't have time. We don't have time. We recognize where the enemy would try to bring a fence and we just say, no, I don't, I'm not doing it. We, as much as it depends on us, me, live at peace with all men. Now I know this, I wanna say this. There are people that we will not be able to live at peace with. They, it, we can't control them. But as much as it can be with me, I'm living at peace. For the ones who, who persecute me, I bless. For the ones who don't want to reconcile, I bless. I bless. I bless. I speak well of. I forgive. In this body, we honor one another. We recognize our need for one another. We can never say, I don't have, I don't have need for that hand. I don't have need for that foot. I don't have need for that hand, just like Paul writes. No one in the body can say, I don't have need for you. There's no one in this room that you can't learn from and that you don't have need of. They have something you need. And you in this room all have something to give. That's how God determines and puts the body together. And that's how we grow up in unity. From the youngest child to the newest believer to the oldest saint, there is no, well, they're really important in the body. Nope. It's not how it works in the kingdom. We all have something to give and we all have something to receive. And as we recognize that and operate that way, oh, that's the best. So I just want to say that to you. If you feel like, well, I'm just, I'm just a learner, amen. So am I. I don't have a lot to give. Yes, you do, because God placed you in this body. Step in. So I'm on this real quick. What, what is our response? What does this mean? First and foremost, you and I, all, we all have the DNA of the Holy Spirit, meaning we have the unity DNA. It's in us. We, we have it in us. So be an ambassador. I commission you today. You are evangelists of unity. You are evangelists of unity. It's in you. It's on you. Because you're part of the body. Meditate on that pasture. Past, pasture. Feed in the pasture of John 17. Meditate on that passage of John 17 and see how God will speak to you. See what he will quicken in you. Recognize the schemes of the enemy that work against God's design. Be peacemakers. Yes. Recognize my own need, our own need for transformation in this area. This is Discipleship 101. We don't stop growing. We don't stop changing. <laughs> we don't stop transforming. You know, we need transformation. And the greatest hindrances to unity, honestly, are self and pride. That's just our. And I can't get rid of either of those, but the Holy Spirit will. My part's surrender. Just surrender. Oh, more of you, Jesus. More of you, Holy Spirit. Let go of bitterness, judgments, offenses. A bitter root can spring up and defile many. That's, that's the worry. With that, that's, that's, that's an indicator right there, isn't it, that we're one body. Your bitterness doesn't stay in your little seat. It spills out. And I love how Paul writes in Galatians, don't miss the grace of God. That a root of bitterness would grow up. 
People remain in bitterness because they're not receiving the grace of God for what happened to them. Don't miss the grace of God. He knows far better than anyone what happened in your life and in your heart. And he's got grace to set us free. Don't miss the grace. Grace is gritty. It's powerful. It's not a nice little Christian word. It's a divine enablement to do and become. And then finally, cultivate a heart of humility. Just let the self-life go away. Self's taken us nowhere good. Yield to his life in me. You guys, we live, I absolutely believe this, that we live well. This is our season, regardless of, <laughs> this is our season on the globe as believers. And I do believe that it is. I'm older than batches of you in the room. I don't believe there has, I have seen across our nation as much unity in the body. But isn't it interesting that most people would say, oh boy, this has been a season of disunity. Because I believe the enemy is very much aware of God is restoring the geographical integrity of the local church. Now I want to just close with this. There is a promise in Psalm 133. Behold how good and blessed it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands a blessing. That happens in a household where there's a marriage in unity and a family in unity. That happens in this faith family household where we're dwelling together in unity, keeping short accounts, loving, walking in humility, honoring one another. But think about the magnitude of a commanded blessing coming on a city because of the believers so loved and honored each other in that geography. I believe we are tasting some of that. Eugene Springfield Lane County is not like it was 30 years ago. And I believe that the Lord, through a united people, honoring each other, loving each other, it attracts his presence. It attracts the things of heaven. And this is our hour and our day to see his kingdom come in our city, in our lives, and in our city. So I'm just going to pray over you for a minute. Lord, I thank you that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is what we all are participating in. You're in us, and you've united us with you. Increase in us, Holy Spirit. Have your way in your church. Make us more in love with you, more looking like you, and more united with each other because of that. I bless this house. I thank you for the history here. I thank you that they do give themselves to this unity of the body, to contend for it as one man. And so I bless that and that you would strengthen and increase in this place and in every member's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us.
you feel me so calm down Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will fill me Oh, come and fill the sky Unite our hearts, Lord you guys of this blessing you can go lord may you light our feet and guide us to go be a people of unity to the community around us this week in christ's name amen hey you guys are dismissed have a great weekend and great fourth of july